Um, I'm not entirely sure it's uh, necessary to reintroduce our good old friend from just 24 hours ago, but I will take this time uh, to express our gratitude for your lecture yesterday uh, and for setting the scene so nicely for the lecture today on what we can achieve, which you laid out beautifully yesterday. Without further ado, Dr. Thomas Grayfin. Great, thank you again, Gina. Um, one always appreciates, appreciates a good introduction, so I missed it this time, but that's okay, we'll proceed. Uh, and I understand that you just um, spent uh, a little time with Dimitri Frenin, a very good colleague of mine. Uh, it's always difficult uh, to follow Dimitri because he is so good on uh, not only Russian foreign policy, but on US-Russian relations. Uh, Dimitri and I have known each other for probably 30 or more years now. We've actually done some work together uh, and some of the thoughts that I'm going to express uh, today uh, are ones that the two of us uh, first uh, wrote down in an article that appeared last year uh, called A New Model for U.S.-Russian Relations. Uh, but where we left the, the discussion yesterday uh, was on, on the point that the rivalry between the United States and Russia is systemic. It's not a matter of some misunderstanding. It's not a matter of uh, the personal idiosyncrasies of various leaders. This really is um, a rivalry that is grounded in history uh, in different views uh, of how the world should function uh, in different visions of what each country's role on the global stage should be. And I think one of the questions uh, that comes up when we talk about US Russians, uh, Russian relations today uh, is how much they matter at all. Uh, if you look at the most recent national security guidance, or at least the guidelines that the Biden administration uh, uh, issued back in March of this year, it's clearly the focus of, uh, of the Biden administration is China. China is the uh, strategic competitor, the long-term challenge to the United States across all dimensions of power, whether it be military, technological, commercial, uh, diplomatic, cultural, uh, and so forth. And if you look at those documents, Russia figures actually uh, only in a small portion of it. And Russia is presented not so much as a, as a peer competitor, as another great power, but as a destabilizing force uh, on, the, on the global stage. Uh, and you certainly get the impression that the administration believes that this is a problem uh, that will go away in the not too distant future, perhaps not in the lifetime of this administration, uh, but perhaps more likely in a decade, in part because of the problems that Russia uh, itself is facing. Uh, and it's clear that there is a tremendous asymmetry in power uh, and fortune between our two countries. That's been clear for at least the past 30 years. And it's also clear that the U.S.-Russian relationship is not the central action, axis of global affairs the way it was during the Cold War. The U.S.-China relationship has has occupied that central position in global affairs today. But I would argue uh, that it's simply wrong to dismiss Russia uh, as a major global player. Russia has been historically a pillar of world order and it's going to be one uh, for many, many years to come. It is one of the few truly great powers in the world today that is a sovereign power that pursues a foreign policy, an independent part foreign policy, uh, in order to advance its national, its national interest. It is a country uh, that governs itself uh, without uh, undue outside interference. But more important than that, even among great powers, Russia and the United States uh, occupy a special class. We are, as we all know, the two major nuclear powers in the world, the two countries that have within uh, our, cap our capacity, uh, the capacity to destroy one another in 30 minutes and civilization as we know it on the global, uh, on a global basis. Uh, in addition, we are the two countries with the largest natural uh, endowments in the world, countries that are perhaps better uh, situated to withstand breakdown and globalization over the, next, uh, over the next several years or decades, because we're the two countries that can pretend to something that's close to self-sufficiency. Uh, and finally, uh, we are the two countries, uh, perhaps along with China, whose power is increasing quite rapidly. Uh, we are the primary countries uh, that can project power 
into all parts of this great Eurasian landmass, into Europe, the Middle East, South Asia, uh, and East Asia. Uh, and for this reason, this is a very an important relation, uh, relationship. The final element I would add here, and the reason we need to take this relationship seriously, it is clear that over the past five to 10 years, uh, there's been a serious deterioration uh, in the relationship between our two countries and the risk of conflict that could escalate uh, to, a new, to the nuclear level has grown uncomfortably uh, high. And so we need to do something. Now, I would argue that as a basic framework for this relationship, the goals that we're trying to achieve are three. First, in recognition of the destructive capacity uh, of nuclear weapons, our two countries need to maintain strategic stability. And another way of saying it, that is that peaceful coexistence remains an imperative uh, for both countries today as it was during the Cold War. Second, the, the two countries need to find a way to manage their competition responsibly. We need to compete with restraint. We need to ensure that the competition doesn't spin out of bounds. Uh, it escalates into some type of direct conflict between our country, the two countries, with the always ever present uh, a risk that this would escalate to the nuclear level. And then finally, the two countries, because we are major actors on the global stage, need to find a way to cooperate in dealing with the pressing uh, transnational challenges that uh, we face along with all other countries in the world. Uh, and the added importance that comes from that is if you think about climate change, uh, we, along with the Russians, are two of the top four emitters of uh, greenhouse gases. There's no solution to climate change without some level of cooperation between our two countries. When it comes to nonproliferation, uh, it's hard to imagine an effective nonproliferation regime that doesn't include the two countries that have the, uh, the longest and deepest experience uh, in uh, in nuclear weaponry, in thinking about how to, to contain these problems. And the same thing is true as we deal with issues like international terrorism or even the pandemic diseases uh, that are coming forward. So we need to find a way to work together. Uh, and what Dimitri and I argued last year is we really need to develop a new model, a new way of thinking about this relationship. The models uh, that we've used in the past simply are inadequate to the challenges and realities of today. So as we all know, uh, reset and strategic partnership are out um, because of the systemic nature of the competition between our two countries. Um, and things aren't going to change uh, in, the, in, in, in the near future. For strategic partnership to work, Russia would have to accept American leadership. That is simply not going to happen. Uh, the United States would have to be willing to treat Russia as an equal on the global stage. Uh, and it's clear that the United States is not prepared to do that because, in fact, from the Washington standpoint, these two countries are not equal uh, in, their, in, their, uh, in their capabilities. Uh, other people have talked about a balance of power system. Uh, looking back at the uh, 19th century uh, in Europe, I think this is a, an idea that takes into account uh, the continuing rivalry between our two countries. But the problem uh, with that model uh, with regard to the present day is that the international system today, uh, if it reflects the balance of power system in Europe, it reflects it in the late 19th and early 20th century. That is when the balance of power system uh, was uh, finally coming under tremendous stress. Uh, the challenge that a rising Germany posed to the ruling hegemon in that time, the United States, Paralyzed, a parallel by the rising cha challenge that China is posing to the United States on the global stage today. And we all know how the breakdown of the balance of power system in the early 20th century ended uh, in Europe. Uh, the final uh, model that people talk about, I think, is perhaps more applicable to the, the current situation with uh, the necessary adaptations. Uh, and that is the time. Uh, the policy that the United States and Russia as the Soviet Union pursued in the 1970s uh, for uh, about um, five or six years uh, in, in, in total. Oh, a way of working together that did uh, uh, reinforce strategic stability, did lessen the degree of competition between the 
the two countries. Um, the cooperation on global issues was somewhat less in part because there weren't a lot of global issues that uh, we had to deal with together at that time. Now, you have to adapt it, uh, that model to the current period because as I said, Russia uh, and the United States no longer are the central axis, axis in global affairs, the United States and China are, but perhaps more important is that the world of the 1970s was genuinely bipolar uh, with a few uh, sort of exceptions uh, on the side, trying to be the most important one. Uh, the world today is multipolar or polycentric, as the Russians like to say, uh, and it's also globalized, it's interconnected. Uh, and that creates a different environment in which we're going to conduct uh, the, 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 the US-Russian relationship. Uh, first, if you think about polycentrism uh, and the interconnectedness of the, the system, what this means is that uh, the relationship between the United States and Russia is no longer bipolar, uh, is no longer a zero sum competition because the United States and Russia each has to take into account the reactions of other sort of major powers on the global state, other centers of influence and power uh, as they conduct the relationship between themselves. Uh, and this need to take into account other major powers necessarily introduces an element of restraint in the competition uh, between the United States and Russia. Uh, the second, uh, and I think this is, I think, fundamental and critical when we think about how we're going to move forward in this relationship, is that the bilateral relationship uh, can no longer be the central or the sole aspect uh, of our relationship. Because the world is no longer bipolar, the relationship uh, and the way we conduct our relationship has to be embedded in a, multi, in a broader multilateral framework. Uh, and the way we, uh, Dimitri and I, uh, propose going forward is to think in terms of the creation of what we call ad hoc coalitions of the necessary to deal with specific problems that are not only on the US-Russia agenda, but on the agenda of a number of other countries. And what you need to do is to bring together all those countries, a very limited number of those, that have a real bearing on how a problem uh, can be resolved. And this is something that we practice in the past. If you think about the various uh, contact groups that were formed in the 1990s to deal with the Balkan context con uh, uh, crises, if you think about the P5 plus one that was put together to deal with the Iranian nuclear deal, the six party talks, uh, for example, to deal with North Korea. If you think more recently uh, of the way the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia came together about a year ago uh, to deal with the, uh, the tremendous instability in, in global oil markets uh, and made an effort to stabilize those markets uh, at, a, at, an appropriate, uh, at an appropriate price level. Uh, so these uh, ad hoc coalitions uh, I think recognize the reality of the world today. And they also recognize that the very few issues that the United States and Russia uh, can resolve between themselves. Uh, and it seems to me that the way forward in this relationship uh, is to multiply uh, these multilateral format for us uh, and do that uh, in a way that deals with not only some of the issues that I've already talked about, but more broadly about strategic stability, uh, and about regional architecture uh, and regional, uh, uh, regional problems. So if we think creatively, uh, obviously, uh, we, we need at some point to build a Russia-US-China trilateral dialogue to deal with strategic stability. I think both Moscow and the United States recognize that the challenge is going to be to bring Beijing on board, uh, in part because Beijing uh, believes that its own nuclear arsenal uh, is so much smaller than that of the United States and Russia uh, that it doesn't want to engage and doesn't want to lock itself into an inferior position. But I think there are ways that we can do this uh, if we break out the uh, actual strategic nuclear weapons from the broader issues of strategic stability, which include intermediate range ballistic missiles, space weapons, missile uh, defense, and so forth, cyberspace, cyber weapons, areas, uh, where China uh, is not 
uh, if not the equal of the United States and Russia at this point, is certainly ra rapidly catching up. But we can also think about a continuation of the Russian, Saudi, US trilateral discussion on oil markets as a way of trying to continue uh, to stabilize these markets as we look forward in the future. But some other ideas uh, that also I think would be promising uh, is a multilateral dialogue that includes the United States and Russia, along with France or Germany, to deal with the big problems uh, of European security, uh, the frozen conflicts, uh, for example, uh, the questions of uh, stability uh, along the, the long NATO-Russia frontier. Uh, we could also think about a Russia-US-Israeli uh, trilateral uh, to deal with the, the problems of the, of the Middle East, uh, Iran, but also more broadly, a bunch of regional issues. And this would build on a very, uh, I think, important dialogue uh, that these three countries held a couple of years ago uh, in order to, uh, again, try to uh, develop some sort of common understanding of how uh, to deal with the, the unfolding crisis in Syria at that time. Uh, other possibilities are uh, trilateral, uh, excuse me, uh, dialogues with India that would focus more broadly on the problems of Eurasia, or a trilateral uh, a dialogue with Japan that would focus more specifically on the problems of Northeast Asia. So there are probably many more that we can think of. Uh, now, uh, ideally, these are dialogues that would be conducted uh, between the governments at an official level. But I think we all recognize uh, that many of these uh, dialogues are not right for discussion at the official level at this point. Uh, and here's the place where the experts uh, communities come in. Uh, I think it's possible uh, to bring together experts from these various countries in appropriate forum to begin the discussion uh, to bring together people who are a bit freer in the way they can express themselves and think more creatively, uh, and then people who are locked into bureaucratic uh, position, official positions can at this point. And indeed, we we'll see that a number of these are underway already. Uh, I have participated in the past year in the Russia-India U.S. trilateral, uh, a Russia-Japan-U.S. trilateral, uh, preparing uh, to participate in a U.S.-EU-Russia trilateral. Uh, sometime in the fall. Uh, so these are important developments. And if we think about it and we work in this direction, the way we're going to stabilize and make this relationship more predictable, the way we're going to uh, restrain uh, competition and develop cooperation on transnational issues where, where we need to, is to think of this relationship uh, as a network of multilateral reinforcing fora uh, and mitigate the asymmetries in the relationship between the United States and Russia, enrich discussions uh, by bringing in uh, other voices that have important things to say on particular issues, and then also uh, helping to ensure that any decisions that we make uh, can be in, uh, enacted in the real world because the important countries and necessary countries are in it in discussions from the very beginning. And we've created something that may be called a public uh, private partnership for the advancement of stability and predictability in U.S.-Russian relations. So that is the broad model uh, that, of course, leaves open the question of exactly what we're going to do, what the concrete policy should be. Now, here I want to take a step back uh, and talk a little bit uh, about the, the three readings I gave you. Uh, one's by Mike McFall, uh, Victoria Newland, and myself on the US-Russian relationship uh, and point out what I think is a, a fundamental divide within the expert community at this point uh, and something that we can discuss um, uh, in the remainder of this, uh, of this session. I think if you look at the, the three articles, you'll see that there are a number of common positions. All three of us, for example, do believe that a key element uh, for an effective Russia policy is really work at home. Uh, we need to deal with the very real problems uh, that we face here in the United States, socioeconomic and political. Uh, we need to revive the economy. Uh, we need to deal with our uh, social issues. Uh, uh, the issue of systemic racism has become particularly prominent at this point. We need to find a way uh, to, um, to overcome this 
profound polarization uh, that has existed in the United States for the past several years and seems to be sharpening in the current period. And all this is a way of beginning to rebuild uh, the United States so that we can project ourselves on the global stage in a much more appealing and attractive fashion and than we have over the past uh, several years. Uh, the three of us, Mike McFall, Toria Newland, and I also believe uh, that a key element of the relationship with Russia should be working on strategic stability. Uh, we all supported in one way or another the extension of the New START agreement uh, to allow some time uh, for Russia and the United States to sit down and develop a new concept uh, for strategic stability that takes into account uh, the radical changes in the strategic landscape for the past decade, uh, but also lays the basis uh, perhaps for a future arms control regime uh, that will reinforce strategic stability going into the future. So there are areas of, of common interest, but I think the real divide comes when we deal with the areas of competition, the, are, the areas where it's hard to see the United States uh, and Russia coming to agreement in the very near term. Now I would put uh, McFall and Newland on one side, myself on the other side. I think if you look at the uh, McFall and Newland articles, uh, their key point is that the fundamental problem in the relationship emerges from the nature of the Russian regime, specifically from President, President Putin himself. Uh, and they don't see any significant improvement in the relationship without change in Russia itself. So they're looking for, uh, in a word or in a phrase, regime change. Um, no confidence that that's something that will happen uh, in the near term, uh, but a very firm belief that without regime change sometime in the future, it's not going to be able, we're not going to be able to put this relationship on a more constructive and enduring track. Uh, if you think about the way they, they talk about interacting with the Russians, to the extent they talk about negotiations, it's really negotiations not to resolve problems so much, it's really negotiation over the terms of Russia's capitulation. Uh, they don't uh, suggest that the United States is prepared to compromise, whether it be on the Ukrainian issue, Belarus, uh, Syria, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, the goal is uh, to get Russia finally to agree that the terms that the United States has laid out. Um, and I think they, they do that with the vision of the Cold War in the back of their minds. And they look at the Cold War as a whole. So the argument that they would make is, that the United States pursued a policy of containment over 40 years. Uh, that strategic patience uh, allowed uh, for the, the inner workings of the Soviet regime, the dysfunction of the Soviet regime, eventually to come to the surface, uh, lead to a systemic crisis in the Soviet Union that ultimately resulted in the collapse, its collapse, and the triumph of the United States uh, in the Cold War. And that's the type of policy they are uh, proposing going forward. Contain Russia uh, and contain it for as long as we need to uh, for the, ch the necessary changes to occur in Russia to allow for the type of the relationship that we would like to see. I approach this from a, uh, a significantly different position. Uh, and I don't believe that the problem uh, is simply Putin or simply the regime. As I argued yesterday, I think the problem is systemic. Uh, and the problem, to put it in a word, is Russia in one way or another, uh, that this is a fundamentally uh, competitive relationship. Uh, I don't think that we have uh, the ability to change what happens inside Russia. Uh, I don't think that we have the ability to change the way Russia thinks about its national interest. And so we need to deal with Russia as it is and as, as it's going to be over the uh, over the foreseeable future. A policy of containment doesn't work and it certainly doesn't work in an, in an interconnected globalized world uh, when big countries like China and India are not prepared to follow our lead. Uh, and when I think of negotiation, I think that negotiation ought to be a, an effort to try to uh, resolve uh, outstanding differences. It ought to be an effort to, at a minimum, if we can't resolve those the problems to reduce the tensions in order to reduce the risk that we're going to 
uh, wind up in a conflict that neither side truly wants. And so the questions we ought to be asking when we deal with Russia are the following. We need to ask, what is Russia trying to do? What is Russia's interest in this, uh, in this matter? The analogous question of ourselves, what are we trying to do? What is our interest? Uh, and then two similar questions to both sides. That is, what can Russia bring to bear uh, on a specific issue at, at hand? And what can we bring to bear uh, on a specific issue? And then we take this all together uh, and that leads to the fifth question. What is it possible to do at the current moment that advances American national interest? As I said, this is not necessarily an effort uh, to reach an ultimate resolution of the problem at hand, uh, but it is a matter of negotiating, finding compromises that lead to incremental advantages, incremental steps forward uh, in uh, the pursuit of American national interest that can accumulate over time and eventually get us to a different place. Uh, but it's also a, a posture that recognizes that we won't be able to do that unless Russia also believes that it is making some sort of incremental advantage, uh, in an incremental gain in the pursuit of its own national interests. So we need at each stage along the way to be able to satisfy the minimal security requirements of each side if we're going to have an enduring um, settlement if we're going to be able to continue the negotiations uh, over various various issues. Now, if we think more specifically about uh, what needs to be done, what grows out of this approach to Russian, uh, US-Russian relations, uh, I would argue that the three immediate steps that we need to take uh, to reduce the tension in relations, some of which uh, or I think all of which have been undertaken by the Biden administration along with Putin uh, at the, uh, the summit in Geneva, not fully, but at least partially. So we have the agreement on the extension of New START and the launching of strategic stability talks in the very near future. We have the agreement that we're going to talk about cybersecurity, uh, and that will inevitably get into the questions of interference uh, in the domestic affairs of each, uh, of each, uh, 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 of each other. Uh, and then finally, we need to restore diplomatic relations uh, as a way of conducting uh, a broader uh, and more successful relationship. Uh, and we've taken the initial step in doing that by allowing the two ambassadors to return to their posts in Washington and Moscow. Although the, the larger question of restaffing the embassies for a more intense diplomatic engagement uh, is yet to be uh, as yet to be agreed. Now, the one point I would sort of underscored here uh, uh, is that when we talk about diplomatic engagement, uh, we're not talking about a return to business as usual. A charge is often made by those who oppose uh, closer diplomatic contact with the United States. Uh, you know, we're not engaging uh, in diplomacy uh, in part because uh, we're trying to build a partnership with Russia. We understand that the relationship is one of rivalry, which we're trying to manage. Uh, in addition, restoration uh, of diplomatic uh, engagement without any significant changes in Russia's posture is not, I would argue, a reward for bad behavior on the part of the Russians. Uh, it's really a recognition that the United States uh, can advance its own interests only through diplomatic dialogue, that we need to have a greater understanding of how Russia defines its own national interest, we need to have a better understanding of where Russia uh, puts its red lines. We need to have a better understanding uh, of how Russia thinks about the challenges it faces going forward. Uh, if we're going to avoid the types of miscommunications and misperceptions uh, that turn uh, tensions and crises uh, into military conflicts. Okay, so those are the immediate steps that we're moving in that direction. The larger question then becomes, how do we deal uh, with the, the big issues that are out there? Uh, uh, to name some of them, obviously we have a range of regional issues in the Arctic, Europe, um, the Middle East, uh, and East Asia uh, to begin with. Uh, the Arctic, I think, is, uh, is a fairly straightforward problem at this point. There's been good cooperation between Russia and the United States 
uh, and other members of the Arctic Council uh, in dealing with the environmental uh, challenge that face uh, exploitation of resources uh, in the Arctic. Um, this is something that we need to continue and it would be particularly important uh, for U.S.-Russia relations because Russia has uh, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council for the next two years. Here is a forum where we can productively work with Russia and other Arctic countries to deal with the very real problem of, uh, of global warming. Uh, the ice cap, as we know, uh, is, excuse me, uh, excuse me. Uh, global warming is proceeding about twice as fast in the Arctic as it is elsewhere in the globe. We've seen a tremendous uh, receding of the ice cap over the past several years, uh, which has opened up new opportunities for exploration of the resources of the Arctic, as well as for the opening up of uh, lucrative maritime sea routes. Uh, the challenge that we face, and the one we need to get our hands around in the, uh, in the near term, is the issue of geopolitical competition that grows out of militarization. Uh, Russia, I think, quite clearly has reinforced or built up its military presence uh, in the Arctic. Uh, much of this for very good, uh, good reasons. Uh, as, the, uh, as the Arctic Ocean opens up, Russia for the first time uh, in history has to defend uh, an Arctic coastline. It has to be able to uh, provide the types of uh, safety and security uh, measures you need if we're going to have uh, uh, a, a shipping lane through that part of the, the Arctic. Uh, it needs to be able to deal with the possibilities of terrorists or proliferators using the Arctic uh, for uh, their nefarious purposes. And all of that requires a certain military presence. Other countries uh, that are also bordering on the Arctic are also at the same time building up their military presence as well. As well. What we need to prevent uh, is the sense that this really is a geopolitical competition, uh, that this is going to lead to some type of military confrontation be the, between the countries in the Arctic. Now, there's no uh, reason for uh, military confrontation at this point. The borders in the Arctic are fairly well delineated at this point. We have agreed uh, economic zones. In fact, the only major uh, territorial dispute in the Arctic at this time uh, is between the United States and Canada uh, up uh, in the northern reaches uh, above Alaska, for example. Uh, the other possible, possible point of tension uh, as the sea routes begin to open up uh, is the northern sea route. Uh, the United States uh, does not recognize that as an internal waterway the way the Russians do. We see it as an international waterway, uh, and different rules apply depending on whether uh, the water route is internal or, or international. Uh, now, this could lead to some sort of uh, confrontation, uh, but the only point I would make here is we have a similar dispute with Canada over the Northwest Passage through Canada. Uh, and we ought to be able to find a, a reasonable way of dealing with this uh, in the near term while we try to sort out the differences between, uh, between our countries. So the Arctic, I think, is an area where cooperation uh, is possible and an area uh, where obviously multilateral uh, engagement is going to be necessary. Europe is a somewhat um, a more complex problem. We have to deal with frozen conflicts. Uh, we have to deal with the issue of re reduction of tensions along the NATO-Russia frontier. Uh, here, as I've already indicated, I think uh, a formal and informal dialogue among the United States Russia, uh, Japan, and Germany uh, would perhaps uh, be useful in trying to think through how these, how we deal with these issues. This has been the format, um, in fact, if not in uh, sort of formal structures that we've used uh, to, to try to manage the Ukraine conflict over the past seven, seven years. Obviously, when we deal with a country, a specific country like Ukraine or Georgia or Kosovo, those actual countries ought to be needed need to participate in the dialogue as well. These are not issues that can be resolved over their heads. Uh, but again, this creates a diplomatic platform uh, in which we can work through the issues, uh, tamp down the, 
the potential for an undue escalation in the conflict. Same thing when it comes to dealing with the NATO-Russia frontier. We need to have conversations about how uh, we limit military exercises along the borders for transparency and the way troops are deployed. Uh, and also, uh, we ought to come to some agreement uh, that uh, inter intermediate range uh, ballistic force missiles will not be deployed in the European theater. In the sense, a continuation of the INF Treaty uh, that both countries have walked away with, uh, but under different circumstances. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, I think the real challenge here uh, is for the United States and Russia, uh, and perhaps a couple of other countries in the Middle East to think through how you maintain uh, a balance of power in the Middle East. Neither Russia nor the, uh, nor the United States has an interest in any single country dominating the Middle East. Um, that goes for Russia uh, in its relationship with, uh, with Iran, for example. Um, Russia has enjoyed a very good working relationship with Iran over the past several years, but no way uh, does it want to see Iran as a dominant influence throughout the Middle East. In fact, if you think about the way Russia has conducted its diplomacy in that region over the past several years, it has deliberately reached out to countries like Israel, like Saudi Arabia, like Turkey, like Egypt, none of which are Iran's friends, as a way of creating room for di diplomatic maneuver, but also as a way of sending a signal to, to Tehran that there are limits to how far Russia is prepared to support Iranian ambitions. The United States also has uh, no interest in a single power dominating the Middle East. Uh, and this, I think, provides the basis for a broader dialogue uh, between our two countries. As I said, a dialogue that brings in Israel could also have some very interesting consequences for the way we think about the region uh, and the way uh, sort of Israel has perhaps the most advanced uh, power in, in the Middle East figures in the calculations uh, between uh, the United States and Russia. Uh, and finally, and I'll end here uh, on, uh, on East Asia, you know, the dialogues that I talked about uh, with India, with Japan, and also supplemented by a very necessary dialogue with China uh, can begin to get us focused on the uh, sort of institutions and rules and regulations that we're going to need uh, uh, to put in place if we're going to regulate uh, or uh, regulate what is going to be perhaps the most uh, difficult uh, region in the world going forward. It has to have a security element for obvious reasons. It has to have an economic uh, component uh, and it has to have a technological component. Um, but we're not going to be able to solve this, obviously, uh, through a U.S.-Russia dialogue, only by bringing in the key powers of the region is there a chance that we'll be able to stabilize this relationship going forward. So that, I think, is a very brief overview of the nature of the, the relationship, uh, a way that we can structure it in order to uh, advance what I think are, again, the three critical goals of this relationship. And that is one, maintaining strategic stability. Two, is conducting our, our competition with restraint and with responsibility, and then finding openings uh, for the, excuse me, before the cooperation we need with these emerging global challenges. So with that, uh, let me stop, and I'm more than happy to entertain your questions, your criticisms, and so forth. <laughs>